All right, students, let's get started with the notes. We're going to be talking about simple covalent compounds. So pull out your piece of paper, get your science notebook ready. Here's the essential question. How do covalent compounds differ from ionic compounds? Now, this is a pretty deep question. It's not going to be able to be answered simply. We need to understand what covalent compounds are, maybe how they attach differently to the ionic compounds, how they're named differently. There's a lot of deep stuff to this. So let's go ahead and get started. First, let's review what a compound is. You might recall that a compound is a substance made of two or more different types of elements that are chemically bonded. Now, we've been learning about ionic bonds or ionic compounds for a while. We're going to switch gears now and talk about covalent bonds and how they're different. To start that off, I would challenge for you. This is a thought prompt. I challenge you to pause the video right now and see if you can answer these two questions all on your own. This is a good indication about how well you're understanding things. The first question is, is why do atoms form bonds? And the second question is, how do ionic compound form, compounds form bonds? Pause the video. Did you try it yourself? I hope so. That's the best way to learn is to go back and review and try to remember yourself. Let's start with why do atoms form bonds? Well, the simple answer is to fulfill the octet rule. Now, how about ionic compounds? How do they form bonds? Well, what they do is they give and take electrons from each other, and then they become oppositely charged. And that's why they form bonds or how they form bonds by fulfilling the octet rule, becoming charged and sticking with one another. So let's remind ourselves, what's that octet rule? Why do atoms form bonds? Well, all atoms will naturally fill their valence orbit to eight electrons. That's the octet rule. Now, ionic compounds we saw either gain or lose their electrons. Some elements, the metals, will lose their electrons to the nonmetals, which will gain them, they become charged and they fulfill their octet and stick with one another. Now, covalent compounds don't work on that principle. We're going to talk a little bit about how they share electrons a little bit differently. Now, just as a note with the octet rule, hydrogen and helium only need two to fill their outer shell. We still call it the octet rule, even though it's not eight, it's just two. So what is the definition of a covalent compound? Well, a covalent compound is a compound between two or more nonmetal atoms where they fulfill the octet rule by sharing electrons. So the big important terms here, nonmetal atoms sharing electrons. Now, in this class, in this module, we're only really going to learn about simple covalent compounds, or what I mean by that is covalent compounds made of just two different types of elements. There are lots of covalent compounds made of many different types of elements, as long as they're all non-metal, they're covalent. But we're just going to simplify and talk about simple covalent compounds. Now, before I move on, some of you might be thinking, I've had student misconceptions, and I want to I want to address that right now. Some students ask me, say, T-Pop, how do you non-metals bond? How do non-metals bond if they all have negative charge? Now I say, hey, elements on the periodic table actually don't begin with a charge. And students are like, well, wait a minute. We just learned about ionic compounds. And we even wrote on our periodic table all the charges of all the different elements on the periodic table. What do you mean they don't have charge? And I want to remind you guys that elements can become charged when metals and nonmetals meet each other, they give away and take away, the give and take electrons and become charged, but they don't start off charged. So don't get that misconception. Even though we wrote the charges on the periodic table, those are ch charges that the elements can become, not that they are charged. And in fact, this is not how covalent compounds work. So how do covalent compounds work? Let's take a look at an example here. Here's nitrogen and hydrogen. These are two nonmetal atoms. Now, they do not want to give away their electrons. Neither element wants to give away an electron, and neither one, but they, they both want more electrons. Nitrogen has five right now. It needs eight. Hydrogen has one, and it, it actually needs two. So what are they going to do? Well, this is what's going to happen. They're going to sit close to each other, and they're going to share their electrons. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here's nitrogen and what it counts as its electrons. And here's hydrogen and what it counts as its electrons. When they sit close to each other, their valence electrons overlap and they're shared between them. They're kind of double dipping in those electrons. So hydrogen right now is full. It's, a, it's fulfilled its valence and reached its two. Nitrogen hasn't quite yet. So what nitrogen is going to do is it's going to find two more hydrogen atoms with a total of three hydrogen atoms and fulfill those, they fulfill its own octet. Now again, this is how a covalent bond works, where they share electrons, where those electrons overlap. This, by the way, is the formula for this compound, NH3. 
Now, what we just saw was a single bond. A single bond is where two electrons are shared between atoms. So this compound right here has three single bonds. Here's a single bond, here's a single bond, and here's a single bond. Oftentimes, scientists write single bonds with lines between them. So here would be NH3 with three lines between the Ns and the Hs. Those are just two electrons represented in those lines. Now, nitrogen does have some non-bonding electrons. These electrons up here are not participating in this bond. Sometimes elements in order to bond might form double bonds. This is where four electrons are shared between atoms, typically two from one element and two from another element. So here we see an oxygen molecule or O2 being formed when four electrons are shared between them. It even goes all the way up to triple bonds. This is where six electrons are shared between atoms. So here we have two nitrogens. When they bond together, there's six electrons they share between, and we often write them with triple lines between them like this. So single, double, or triple bonds all exist between elements. They can share two, four, or six sets of or two, four, or six electrons. So how do we figure out how, what type of bond an element has? These are kind of the steps to drawing covalent dot structures. Um, go, let's go ahead and follow along with me. This is CO2. You might be familiar with CO2. This is carbon dioxide. What we're going to do first is sum the valence electrons. So here we have one carbon, and there are four valence electrons. If we find the periodic table, carbon has four valence electrons. There are two oxygens, and each of those oxygens have six valence electrons. So we have a total of 16 valence electrons to work with. So we're going to sum the valence electrons for our compound. Next, we're going to write the symbol, and we're going to do it symmetrically. Notice that there's two oxygens and only one carbon. So when I draw, when I write the symbols, I'm going to put two oxygens, one on either side of the carbon, and make it so it's kind of a symmetric looking molecule. All right, number three states to connect elements with a single bond. So right now, these elements are not bonded, so we need to put some electrons in there in order to show them bonding. So I'm going to put two between one oxygen and carbon and two between the carbon and the oxygen. That's a single bond. Now, this is not necessarily how they might end up. We need to figure out the rest in a minute. So by the way, we just used four of those total of 16 valence electrons. So now we only have 12 left. So what we're gonna do is step four, we're gonna complete all the octet. So I'm gonna start with the oxygen on the left side and just do two, four, six. So that oxygen's done. And then I'm gonna go two, four, six for the other oxygen. So that's 12 total other electrons that we put in here. Let's take a look how we're doing on our octets. This oxygen is happy. It has a total of eight electrons. This carbon, not so happy. It only has four electrons. It needs an octet. This oxygen over here is good. It has eight total valence electrons. All right, so let's go to step five now. It says steal two electrons from the rich and share with the poor. And so we're gonna steal electrons from non-bonding sets and make them become bonding in order to kind of keep that going. So on this electron, this oxygen to the left, I'm gonna move two electrons from non-bonding to bonding. And that brings us closer. Notice I, I still have an octet with that oxygen. Carbon's still not happy, however, so I'm going to go ahead and steal from the other oxygen and give it to the carbon in the middle. So now we have two sets of double bonds. So that's a double bond right there. Now every element in this covalent compound has fulfilled the octet by sharing either two, four, or six electrons between them. These are four different ways to draw CO2, by the way. Here is the molecular, the chemical formula, but you might also see it in these molecular um, structures. Here's kind of the bubble structure, and here's the ball and stick method right here. Or like I said, you can sometimes draw lines between them. All four of these are showing the same thing. They're showing carbon dioxide molecules. All right, so how do we name covalent compounds? There's a little bit different. There's some similarities between ionic, but there's also some differences. In order to name covalent compounds, we need to include a prefix before each element to represent the number of elements in that compound. Now, this prefix right here, number one means mono. Think like a monocle or a single glass. Two means di, like to divide something in two. You're probably familiar with tri, tetra, penta. A lot of these we use in math, like or tricycle for three, tetra for four, penta for five. 
Hexa 6, Hepta 7, Octa 8, Nona 9, and Deca, like Decade is 10. Like these, these are on the back of your periodic table. You don't have to memorize them, but know that they're there. And these prefixes are only used for covalent compounds. One thing to note, we don't always use mono. We definitely never use it for the first compound, and sometimes we don't use it for the second, but sometimes we do. But when we name covalent compounds, we include these prefixes before each of the elements in order to figure out how many there are. And we always end in ide for covalent compounds. So let's choose do some examples here. You might want to have your periodic table out and take a look at the elements and their prefixes. So here we have CO2, one C and two O's. This is named carbon dioxide because there's two oxygens. Next is C and O, just one of each. So we're gonna call this carbon monoxide or carbon monoxide. So carbon dioxide is stems from your body. We breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide might come from your furnace. They're both two different types of covalent compounds with different numbers of oxygens in them. Notice we did not call this monocarbon monoxide. We never use mono for the first element. Sometimes we don't use it for the second one too. All right, the third one is C2O5. That's two carbons and five oxygens. So it's dicarbon pentoxide. Next is dinitrogen nonoxide, so two nitrogens and nine oxygens. Next is nitrogen dioxide, so one nitrogen, two oxygens. The last one, nitrogen oxide. If you said nitrogen monoxide, you would be right as well. Like I said, mono sometimes is used for the second element to mean one. Sometimes we don't even use mono as for, for at all. We just say oxide or whatever it is. Some molecules have street names, by the way. So water, for example, is H2O, and that's a street name. We call it water. You could call it dihydrogen monoxide as well. That's technically its chemical IUPAC formula. That's the, the official name for, for H2O. But we've been calling it water forever, so it's kind of a street name. NH3 is another name for NH3 is ammonia. So that also is a street name. Now these last two are polyatomic ions. You have a whole list of polyatomic ions uh, that are kind of weird because they're covalent compounds that technically have a charge. By the way, the reason these covalent compounds have a charge, you might recall when we were moving around valence electrons, when they bond, they just don't have enough valence electrons to fulfill all octets. So they have to steal electrons from other elements, typically metals, when they form kind of a combination of ionic and polyatomic ion compounds. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is diatomic molecules. This is just a list I need you to know right now. We're going to use them later on when we talk about writing chemical equations, but these are technically covalent compounds. These are molecules that are just elements that don't exist by themselves in nature. For example, if we were to find pure hydrogen, hydrogen wouldn't just be an H, it would be H2. If we were to find nitrogen, which nitrogen is in our air and our atmosphere, it's not found as pure N, it's found as N2. Same with oxygen, we would never find just O molecules floating around. They're always floating around as O2. So this list of seven molecules, I would label these on your periodic table, maybe put a little dot in each of these um, element boxes on your periodic table, and then just write on your periodic table that these, the dot or whatever you labeled them as represents diatomic molecules. So I want you to know these diatomic molecules because they're really special and we're gonna need to know them when we write covalent, when we write chemical reactions. All right, that leads us to the end of their notes. Take a moment to review and highlight any of the key stuff from these slides. Don't just write it down and forget about it. Go back to your notes and highlight the important things and review. Ponder and ask questions. You might need to go back to the discussions and ask some questions or offer some answers to some questions for others. Finally, summarize and answer the essential question from these notes in a deep level using any type of evidence or reasoning you can. All right, good luck.